Good evening, Des Moines. Welcome to the Doc and Lefty program here on webcast1live.com. My name is Blake Lefty Labinus, and I'm here with the main man with the plan who's Plans make liberals' hair stand on ends. I'm Dr. Patrick Bertroche. How's it going, Doc? It's going all right. Looks like my uh, microphone just took uh, its own, uh, got a mind of its own. Uh, you know, I, I prefer it when it was a sweltering 80 degrees outside rather than, you know, the it, what 20 degrees it, it feels is like now. What, it feels like what September used to feel like before all of your uh, conservative coal companies ruined the planet. But hey, anyway. You know what? If this is what global warming is all about, I'm leaving my truck <laughs> running outside. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, 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 Doc, we've got a special guest with us tonight. His first appearance on the Doc and Lefty you, program. You know what? Yes. I'm excited about our guest. Me too. But there's something I want that just came up that I think you and I need to talk about. Oh, by all means. Now, were you reading anywhere today about the the problems that we've been having with the Afghani's that they're trying to pull out of the security agreements that they have with us and the rest of it? I been I, keeping up with that? Uh, no. All right. Well, the Afghani's have been want, been threatening to pull out of our security agreements. Have have asked the U.S. to get out of their country. Uh, and this is all rather sudden, and mainly it's over dr the droning. You know, the don't drone me dude, don't drone me bow sure, bro, yeah, uh, yeah. shirt you got. So anyway, um, we've been trying to piece together, you know, something to allow us to be there to help and everything else. Instead of just getting out like they want, uh, one of the conditions is that Obama is going to write a letter of apology to the Afghani people in order to keep troops there. What do you think of that? Well, without having read the story uh, or looked at what was proposed, I'll, I'll I really bring it can't, up on HuffPo. I really can't comment on it. This might be something better suited towards responding to on the blog. Yeah, that could be. Because that I'm not, be. I, I wasn't well, prepared to talk about that today. Me, well, and, you know, we, we, well, we have Ed Bull here in the audience, or in, uh, in the studio. We do. And he's such an exciting, dynamic person that, you know, we, it got tough. Let me give you my spiel on this real quick. Obama can't do enough apologizing to the Muslims. It backfired on him when he first did it. It's going to backfire on him now. Nation states should not ever apologize for trying to pursue their own interests, even if there are mistakes made. You don't mis uh, you don't do those apologies. You uh, apologize when your country has been subjected, such as Japan and Germany. Germany was made to apologize immediately after World War II as a means of sub of subjugating them. The final nail in the coffin. Japan waited until about ten years ago. And under intense pressure, apologize to the Chinese for World War II. They have yet to issue an apology to us. It's just not something you do. You just don't in international politics. This is yet another step in the emasculation of President Obama. He is terribly unpopular overseas, and this is one of the reasons why. Anyway, now I had my piece Look at the block, because Lefty's going to have a response to this, and he'll be it'll be very thoughtful. I was really hoping to, to slug it out, but uh, obviously I, I didn't get him informed in time. That's okay. All right, now, introduce my, it. My, my response? Look at Doc, the block. I disagree. But anyway, <laughs> um, with us tonight is a, uh, um, a special guest. He's the, uh, the Marion County attorney running for uh, re-election down there in 2014, and also a uh, personal friend of mine. Um, all, and we're going to talk about that. Hold on. I thought I was your only friend. I, well, I got two, and they're both conservative dudes. Who would have thought? So, uh, we're but much more accepting um, than Ed liberals Bull, are. Ed Bull, Marion County Attorney. Ed, welcome, and thanks so much for being on the show. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I, you know, what's interesting, though, is uh, I can see why you're speechless when, when confronted with the fact that, once again, President Obama is looking for any distraction from his failed domestic policies <laughs> and and what he chooses to do is is embarrass us on the world stage because he can't do anything worse here at home to embarrass himself even in front of his uh his uh, party supporters it's you know i uh i disagree but anyway which which part that he's at 41 percent that his policies have failed mm. miserably or the fact that he's embarrassing us well, on let's, international if we're scale. Talk, I don't know that a Republican would want to start talking about poll numbers with respect to favorability, unfavorability at this point. 
I think that the that the Republicans as a party are pulling slightly higher than the scum on the bottom of my shoe. And I think that's a pretty accurate scientifically measured poll term scum on the bottom of my shoe <laughs> is that, but, is that, was that a new uh, gallup poll that came I out think, yeah no or, i think it was I, you know the technology is wonderful we now can talk to scum on the bottom <laughs> of Blake's shoe and understand what they're saying well they got their metadata from the nsa so that's how they got to me personally. Yeah, but. well, the other thing is, is, you know, Blake probably got the scum on the bottom of his shoe by going to all these Democratic functions. I, what, what say you, I've, Ed? I've only been photographed at the Republican ones. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I got to be be upfront here. I was thrilled to have Blake uh, perform at my reelection uh, when I. Oh, absolutely. When wow. I indicated I was running for reelection here in August, uh, Blake came down. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, I'll give him a plug. He does a great job. <laughs> I, everyone, Absolutely. everyone was impressed with the fact, and and I, I knew he was a very talented individual. I had no idea just how outstanding he was. You could keep going. This could be the show. I I really have nothing else to add. <laughs> that's all, that's all right. Well, Ed, I I wanted to have you on for a couple of different reasons because you are going. It's you're going for uh, your second term as the Marion County Attorney. You you won you won that four years ago back in uh in 2010, um, and. Base, and sort of it was a it was kind of the decision to run, if I remember at the time, was sort of a surprise, sort of not, because you had been long engaged in private practice with a focus on Marion County. You did all over the place, but you were down in Marion County an awful lot. And so I, just to kind of give us a little history about your relationship with the county and what led you down there. Well, you know, I've told this story quite often. It, it had to do with the, the concept of having to take a moral shower at the end of the day. I had a good friend of mine who called me one day and said, hey, Ed, I need you to take this case. And I said, okay, well, what's going on here? Uh, does the guy can't afford an attorney? Or are you getting out of this? He said, no, it's just the, the topic area was such that I couldn't do it. And it was a sexual assault of a young child. Uh, he said, I, I can't do it, but I knew you could. And that really took me back. Mm. I said, hmm, maybe I'm not doing the right thing anymore. Uh, it also was about the time that uh, we had our second child, and I just said, you know what? Uh, keeping the bad guys out on the street to re-hurt people isn't what I wanted to do anymore. Spent 10 years as a private attorney, uh, enjoyed it, ran a successful firm, employed a number of employees, uh, you know, full disclosure, full including disclosure. you. Yep, that's right. Uh, but it, uh, it was time for a change, and uh, the seat came open. Uh, the incumbent chose not to run again. Uh, I loved Marion County. Uh, as as uh, some of our listeners uh, may know, we have court service days in Mary, er, in the state of Iowa. Rural counties don't have court every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so as a result, I ended almost every one of my weeks on Friday in Marion County, and it was the highlight of my week. <laughs> and my thought was if I could uh, not have to go to Polk County anymore, if I could just make a career – out of serving the people in Marion County with uh, great judges, great clerk personnel, outstanding police officers. That's where I wanted to be. And I got to tell you, this when uh, when this came up and and you called me about, during your first campaign, this is a guy who was living in Des Moines at the time, was down in Marion County a lot, moved down to Pleasantville in an undisclosed location, and uh, um, worked his his tail off to secure. I guess not only, really not only the nomination. There wasn't much of a nominating process, if I remember correctly. No, oh, I had a I had a primary challenger. Oh, you did. Okay, I had a primary I'm, challenger uh, uh, that uh, ran kind of a stealthy campaign. Didn't mm-hmm. see him often out there, uh, but uh, did a real nice job in getting his vote out. Uh, the primary, uh, I think it was a fifty-five forty-five uh, type split. I was glad to have won, but uh, it really brought home. Local politics is getting out your 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 votes, and in yep. the primary, uh, you know we we moved on, ended up winning the general uh, by a substantially larger number, uh, put up about sixty four percent of the vote, and so uh, you know the, the rest the is history. The R by your name, Marion County doesn't help, doesn't hurt. No, absolutely not. It did, yeah. and I would go a step further. It doesn't hurt anywhere. <laughs> All well, right. on that note, Perhaps. we're going to take our first break. We're with uh, Ed Bull, Marion County Attorney. We want to thank him for coming in. We also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Lubina's Law Firm, Betrosian Associates, uh, as well as Miss Kitties and uh, the other corporate sponsors that we have to keep our uh, station op- open. You're listening to Doc on Doc and Lefty on webcast1live.com. We'll be back right after the break. Petrosian Associates, how can I help you?
Petroche and Associates will provide you with a friendly, caring, and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Petroche, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit, you're our hero! From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking around uh, into these subsequent segments we've got here on the Doc and Lefty program. And remember, we're here every 6.30 to 7.30, every Tuesday, right behind the Fallon Forum, and we couldn't be happier to uh, have that relationship with uh, with the Fallon Forum. Uh, they do a lot of good work on their program, and we sure do um, appreciate them giving us a bump every once in a while. But we're here with our guest, Ed Bull, the Marion County attorney. Um, Ed was elected in a landslide, I think it's fair to say, in 2010 down in uh, Marion County due to his... Um, he started working, and he had a, a fairly, um, I would say, I don't want to say coherent as in, like I'm, I'm uh, diminishing your platform that you ran on at the time, but it was definitely not something that you would expect from your quote-unquote run-of-the-mill conservative running for office down in Marion County. And I remember a few of the town the town hall meetings and the, the living room meetings that you had with people, you had to answer some pretty tough questions. And so I was wondering, now gearing up for 2014, if you have an opponent and if you've altered your platform at all or, or what you kind of plan on bringing for, to a second term? No, absolutely not. We, we ran on a couple different, I think, primary issues. First and foremost, uh, not be afraid to try the tough case. Uh, we have now tried in my office more cases in the last three years than my predecessor did in the previous 15. My view is that you negotiate from a position of strength in plea bargaining. You don't plea bargain because you're unwilling to try a case or you're afraid, you're afraid to try a case. You try the cases that need to be tried, and you don't back down. That's not to say that you don't plea bargain cases, because as you well know, 99 out of 100 cases probably get pre bargained We yes. we resolved uh, about 4,100 cases last year. Uh, so the numbers speak for themselves. But to that end, I think there had to be some common sense approaches as well. What we looked at was how can we improve uh, our youth, and how can we rep- improve uh making our society, our community safer. We did two things primarily. We, had, we adopted two initiatives. The first is we started a truancy program. We, inter- we created uh, agreements with the local schools so that we got notified early on when kids started to miss school. Because we know that if we can keep kids in the classroom, they're less likely to be out on the streets uh, committing crimes. Mm-hmm. And we got tough on that. We, we let people know right from the get-go, we're watching, which... Uh, I know some people don't like that, but I'd much rather know when a kid has missed four days of school so that I could try to partner with the parents and some of the local community organizations, try to figure out what the underlying cause of why that child isn't going to school, rather than finding out when the child's missed 16 or 17 days of school and isn't likely to be able to get credit for the classes that they're in. The second thing that we looked at was uh, an intensive treatment court or a drug court program. Marion County, for whatever reason, seem to have an enormous number of public intoxications. Now, I'm the first person to say public intoxication is not the crime of the century. At the same time, it does have an effect if you wake up on Sunday morning, go get your paper, and there's a drunk passed out on your front yard. That diminishes your property values and also makes you not really feel real comfortable about where you're living. And so as a result, we try to figure out how do we, how do we deal with this situation? I'm in a county, uh, relatively smaller population, mm-hmm. and I'm getting three or four public intoxes a week coming across my desk. Some of that's a byproduct of the lack of public transportation, that you have people walking home from the bar, but more likely than not, what we were having is we had an underlying problem as it relates to substance abuse issues. So how do we how do we deal with that situation? Because what I knew to be true is putting a person on probation uh, without adequate resources wasn't a solution. I also knew that you know in this kind of get tough on crime philosophy that I think I have uh, that well I'll send that person to prison two years. Aggravated misdemeanor, and what I was—it hit home pretty darn quickly when uh, 
it was a revolving door at Oakdale at the classification <laughs> center where people were out in 12 days. I said, well, this doesn't work. So I partnered with a treatment counselor in town, the Department of Corrections, local businesses, and we require these people to do a variety of things. Now, they have to pay their fines back, which means they have to have a job. They have to go to treatment. They have to complete treatment. They have to do a life skills class. They have to do community service. In addition, they got to come to court at least twice a month. What I found to be true is, first, no one likes this program, and that's a positive thing. It's gotten out. I've gone from having three or four public intoxics to maybe having one or two a month during the summer because these people are talking to each other. Additionally, I haven't seen these folks back again. The people who are in my program are graduating from the program. They're not picking up new crimes, and their fines are getting paid. So it's been a win-win across the board. That's over the entirety of Marion County. Yes. Holy smokes. Yeah. And uh, and one thing I would I would say is that, um, Ed, when you were in private practice, one of the things that you focused on a lot that was you you, you ran the gamut of of, uh, of of normal criminal defense and what what a uh, and for those of you who, who don't know, there are a lot of different things that go into that. But um, you all but you had a, a heavy focus on on the juvenile court system in Polk County. You, your practice consisted a lot of taking uh, court appointed juvenile cases where you represented parents who were in a bad situation. You represented children as a guardian ad litem, like a guardian ad litem, someone appointed for the kid or for the child. And if if uh, any any listeners out there are familiar with the program, if you're if you're court professionals or or lawyers or whoever, or if you've been through the the system in other counties, you will know that John Sarcone, the county attorney in Polk County, isn't dealing with these cases himself. Ed Bull deals with every single juvenile case that comes through. Now you don't have the largest staff, but you still you could be delegating that responsibility to other uh, other attorneys. But I think it's. Um, could you speak to your relationship with the juvenile court system in Marion County at least? Well, when I was in private practice, you know, there was a joke that got said is that you couldn't swing a bat in a Polk County juvenile courtroom without hitting a bull uh, law office employee. That's that's how I learned. That's that's what I did. That's how I made my living. When I got to Marion County, I, I focused on a couple things. First is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and surround yourself with people who think differently than you do. I feel very strongly about that. I went out and assembled the best possible staff of assistant county attorneys I could possibly find. Mm -hmm. Then I, I would looked agree at with that. Yeah. What What do I want to do? How do I enjoy uh, my job? I kept uh, major felonies, class B, class A felonies, murder, homicide, sexual assaults, and in addition to that, I run our intensive treatment court and I run our juvenile court, whether or not that's delinquency or child in need of assistance actions. I feel strongly about that because I think it's the ability to make the biggest difference. Uh, kids can't protect themselves. They can't, In some cases, based on their age, they can't even speak for themselves. So as a result of that, how do we make sure those kids are safe? You know, you, you flip on, uh, you know, the Internet or you look at Facebook. Even just today, you had a story, I think, out of Tennessee. I may be mistaken on the locale, but where... Oh, my. oh yeah, that was horrible. Children, a child's found in a, in a dog kennel eating... Mm. Parts of herself. She was upside down in a crib that they turned into a cage. And, you know, they found a body outside of a baby. You know, it's just, it, yeah, that kind of stuff. Really. So, I mean, it just, from my perspective, addiction is a real problem. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem without a tremendous number of solutions and, unfortunately, without a lot of resources dedicated to fixing those problems. I, I can honestly say I'm not as concerned about the parent who chooses to use dope. Uh, I'd like to be able to change their behavior, but I recognize I probably can't. But what I can do is make sure that they don't harm a child. And so I take that responsibility, that duty, that obligation as a county attorney seriously. And to that end, I think there's nothing that I is a better use of my time than ensuring the children are safe. Now, I think that we're coming up on a uh, another break, but, but right before we, we go to that, I wanted to ask you, Ed, um, what are some of, just briefly, what are some of the the goals that you have for if you're if you have the opportunity to be reelected um, that you have for the county in your second term and how would you sort of plan on achieving some of those goals first and foremost as as all the counties in the state of Iowa are going to is electronic filing the EDMS system uh, we would bore people to death if we spent a lot of time on it but uh, that is an incredible uh, expense mm -hmm. uh, to an office such as mine. Uh, probably talking in the neighborhood of six figures to get electronically able to file. So having uh, a fiscal conservative nature 
to how it is that we can achieve the goals that are being mandated on us uh, by an unfunded mandate from the state telling us how to do this. Uh, I want to bring us into that procedure as gently as possible with the least amount of financial pain for the citizens of Marion County. Secondly, it's a uh, fine collection. It is a uh, debt collection to ensure that uh, folks, when they commit a crime and they're ordered to pay a fine or equally and probably even more importantly, when they're ordered to pay restitution, we're now going to start keeping track of that. We're going to make sure people who are victims of crime are made whole. Uh, we're starting a debt collection program in Marion County, uh, and I would see that being a, a major initiative over the next 18 months. Terrific. Um, by the way, I, I empathize with your your situation about being forced to uh, go to electronic records and having to bear the expense of that, since that's what every physician in the U.S. has had to go through in every hospital. Uh, we'll be back right after the break. You're listening to Doc Lefty, and we have a special guest, Ed Bull, Marion County Attorney. We'll be back right after the break. I'm going to ask him some pretty, uh, some pretty specific questions about uh, what he believes. We'll be back right after the break. Thank you for tuning in. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking around for the first half hour. We're here with uh, special guest Ed Bull, who's the uh, Marion County attorney. We've been talking to him a little bit about his his, um, his kind of his, his platform and his goals for the future and, and commiserating during the break over the difficulties and sometimes ludicrousy of the that's not even is that word that well, well, well you know what i'm trying to say that, i think that's a word but i'm not i'm not entirely positive all right. well, we, of the edms system but doc you had some questions you want to ask actually we we have a question from a fellow physician here on facebook um he's really asking about the the do you call it the edms is that what you guys yes. call it all right um he, he's asking Wow, where's the government going with that one? And you already answered part of that during the commercial break. You kind of want to expound on what, what was going on? My concern is that being in a rural county, the, the benefit from EDMS clearly is the reduction of paperwork. It also will be uh, a belief that it will become easier for the public to have access to records uh, through uh, the Internet and other such abilities to be able to go to the courthouse, look at an entire file instead of having to have the, the file. My concern is that the reality is what's going to happen is that if I have a courtroom full of people for a court service day, and I'm going to have to create the orders electronically, send them to the judge who then electronically signs the documents, and then they're pushed to the court system or through the clerk's office, excuse me, and then those orders will be sent to the attorneys. And Blake probably has more experience with this because he's practicing law in counties that have already gone mm -hmm. EDMS. Is that a fair... Well, it, it is. I mean, sort of. Except you, you do have it does, and and judges have expressed the same concern to me when I've when I've talked to them in chambers is that they they're afraid that it'll cut down on the personal relationship between lawyers and judges, which is a, the bedrock really of the institution. If you don't have a personal relationship and the judge doesn't know may, maybe who to trust, who not to trust. Who to? Uh, um, I mean, there are lawyers that are untrustworthy. Say well, it isn't so, Lefty. Well, you know, it's. Um, I'll ignore the shot, but <laughs> so, you know, if he can rely on a lawyer that if something is going to happen, it's going to happen that particular way, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, and I think that's to, a problem. To sure. answer uh, the question as posed, here's what I envision: is that there's going to become a time in a cost-saving measure that someone is going to say, "We don't need 
to have judges in the rural counties. We can keep, instead of having to pay mileage to send a judge here or there, why wouldn't we just have judges located at a central place? They'll electronically send the documents in. We can get them signed. I also don't think we're that far-fetched, especially in light of the fact that you see some of the federal court systems using uh, closed-circuit television to handle some matters, that you're, you may turn into a situation where you don't have a live judge in the courthouse, but rather you're appearing on a computer screen and the documents are just being electronically filed. And, now, I, and I guess my response to that, and I think that's a, I think that's a legitimate uh, point to make. You've heard, you've heard throughout the years, over the last several years, whether it be uh, Ch- uh, former Chief Justice Marsha Turnus or current Chief Justice Mark Cady talk about, we don't want to go to regional courts. We want to have ninety nine. We have ninety nine counties. We want a court in every county, and we want to make sure that those those local relationships are maintained. But it is interesting, as you as you point out. There's, that, there does seem to be that, that sort of conflict there that maybe it'll get pushed that way out of necessity. Well, I think that as you saw with the regionalization of school districts, there's no quicker way to kill small towns yeah. than they are to take away your school. Well, imagine what you would do if you'd also take away your courthouse the, as well. The, I, the that would be institutions for sure. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm going to throw in my two cents worth because you can see what's going to happen just by looking at what's happening now in the medical community. Um, I'm one of the very few doctors left in town that doesn't have I do have a laptop in my in my office don't get me wrong and I do do electronic records but I don't do them during the patient interview I write everything down by hand still and I can't tell you how many new patients I have that that's their specific question when they call my office is he electronic the point that you two have made about it becoming much less personal about not being able to develop a relationship with the judge between the judge and the attorney is the same problem we're experiencing now trying to develop a relationship between the doctor and the patient. So I think that, that the concerns you have are very legitimate because that's exactly what's happening in the medical community. Now I have an additional comment. Um, one of the very first supporters I ever had in my campaign just uh, sent me a message says they're very happy you're down there, Ed. You know, well, I'm glad to hear so, that. I'm glad you know, to hear that. So it's not often you ever you hear anybody happy having an attorney around. Hey. You know, honest to goodness, <laughs> it's it, it's like this all the time. I can't catch a break. <laughs> uh, in, in kind of not not to necessarily give a full throated defense of the EDMS system. It's it's a little it's newer than the federal. The federal system is a lot easier to use. I'll say that from experience. But and maybe they'll get some of those kinks worked out as as time goes on. But I will say, I do a lot of plaintiffs' work on the civil side of things, and it is really convenient. It's nice to know that you can file something and have it be considered filed rather than waiting for it to three days to Scott County or five days to one of the rural Northwest. That is very, very convenient. And so that in and of itself makes a lot of sense. And I, and I hope over time that, that I can see the benefits of it. I can, I can just say right now it, I'm not based on my personality ever going to be an attorney who walks into a courtroom without a paper file in my hand. Maybe it's a crutch, uh, but I want to be able to know, that I have the documents, I know what's there. So mm-hmm. I think, quite honestly, in the very short term for me, it's going to be more of a, a duplication issue. We're going to have Absolutely. to scan everything, create everything, yeah. but uh, I'm still not going to to give up my paper file. Now, one of the, the the comment, we have another comment on Facebook. Wow, I didn't know we get this many comments. We're getting there. Ed coming on now. Um, well, I, I'll hang I, on a second. I need to get my glasses on. I did. I, I knew that this would generate a lot. of. So we got, we've got some listeners down on the south, uh, south side of town in the rural counties. You bet. Um, this person says that uh, that uh, he believes that this is to be able to control the po- courts from a centralized position uh, and to give more power to those in political positions as opposed to those based on merit and being elected. What do you have to say about that? I guess I would want s- some additional clarification because I, from my perspective, I think that the system, as I understand it at this point, uh, over time should allow for the public, to be honest, to have more access uh, to records and information. So uh, I'm not certain that that I'm concerned about the centralization uh, any more than it already exists. So I'm, I'm, I, not, I'm right. not following the question, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree all right. with that. For all sure. right. So the, the other thing is, is um, <clears throat> what, what I argue about with electronic health records is people can bust into my office and I have 3,000 patient records. They could steal them, but they would have to physically take these files 
and put them on something significant, suburban, pickup truck, something. Whereas the other day, um, I believe it was, uh, now I don't want to say the insurance company because I can't remember off the top of my head. Insurance company got hacked. 10,000 patient records were violated. My thing is, is, is if the CIA, the FBI, um, the Pentagon, the State Department can't protect their information, what makes it so that, you know, Marion County is going to be able to protect that information? There's a lot of things that go on, then the record is expunged, right? But the problem is, is if it's out there, it's on a server somewhere, it's always going to be made available. It's always going to be available out there. I, I, I understand the concern. I guess my response would be, for the most part, what we're talking about are documents which are public records to begin with. Right. So I, I do have a concern. I think that the the opposing view is the concern that you identified is one that pales in comparison from people who've gone through, such as our friends up in the Cedar Rapids area, where they lost decades of records because of flood. Right. There clearly has to be some type of backup system. I, I can tell you that even in, in, in a county our size, we, we're going through some... Uh, I'm not going to say growing pains, but we're making some real advancements as it relates to IT and other issues. And we had some uh, consultants come in from some other counties that just talked about the number of cyber attacks that are are hitting tiny counties uh, for information. But from a standpoint of a concern about records being stolen, I echo those concerns. Uh, But the documents that are being put online, I would say nine times out of 10, the one exception would be some of the juvenile records. Right. Uh, Those are public records to begin with. So okay, uh, well, can, we'll be back right after the break. We're talking with Ed Bull, Marion County Attorney. Uh, we're gonna have more interesting questions for him after we return. We want to thank all of our sponsors. You're listening to Doc and Lefty here every Tuesday from six thirty seven thirty p.m. on Webcast One Live dot com. We'll be back right after the break. Petrosh and Associates will provide you with a friendly, caring, and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. We are proud to work with military personnel and their families. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Bertroche, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Our licensed mental health therapists provide individual counseling to children, adolescents, and adults, including couples and marital counseling. Visit our website at BertrochianAssociates.com for more information or call 515-334-9484. Our offices are located at 5525 Meredith Drive in Des Moines, just east of Skate North off Merle Hay Road. Isn't it time to talk to someone? Take care of yourself and your family. Contact Bertroche and Associates. Hey, welcome back, everybody. We're here with our guest, uh, Ed Bull, the Marion County Attorney. If I couldn't... Uh, uh, say that enough already this hour. Um, we're uh, sure pleased to have him for the entire hour, and he is uh, running for his second term here starting up in 2014. I know that campaign is going to get going in earnest. Over the break, we've had more comments pouring in about this question about EDMS. A lot of people are concerned about this, and it is, it's a new system, and it bears discussing. And, Doc, I think that you had a, a clarification for, from our our friend who asked him about centralized control or or, or authority with respect to the system. So if you wanted to pose that question to our guest. Yeah, the, the wasn't necessarily about the records. It was uh, more about, you know, centralizing, you know, electronic records. Uh, from his perspective, it was much more about centralizing control of the judges than it would be about, you know, making sure your records are safe and, and controlling that information. Um, from my perspective, I could see this position where, you know, hold on, you know, we're going to start, I mean, you addressed it a little bit that they're not going to have regionalization, but this would be much more of a way to be able to, to monitor and contain judges that would have a tendency to do things more maverick rather than, uh, you know, the, the old conservative way of, of doing things. What's your take on that? My experience has been over the 11 plus years that I've been uh, practicing law. It actually may even be more than that, 12 plus years now. It's been a while. Uh I find our judges to be fiercely independent, uh, and and that isn't a concern that I have. And I do appreciate that judges are uh, retained uh, based on the region or area that they're in. Uh, I I don't have that concern, uh, and I don't 
envision that being a concern moving forward. All right. Um, now, I got another question I, that, that just came to me. Um, did you support removing those three judges with the gay marriage decision? They, they came up with that, or was that something you even want to get into? Well, because, was, because my brother is a very con, is a Christian conservative, and he didn't agree with it. And obviously lefty didn't agree with it. So I was just wanted to know what your take was as a, not necessarily Marion County attorney, but as just as an attorney. I, I can say this. Uh, the Varnum decision, I think, has far-reaching uh, issues. Uh, I am a traditional pro-marriage person, uh, but I did not believe that a single decision should cost judges their job. But I also believe that every person who reached a decision to choose to not retain a judge's for whatever reason, was an appropriate reason for the, them to exercise their right to do what they wished on the back of the b- ballot. So not trying to duck the issue, uh, but I think, uh, you know, ver- uh, decisions that come down uh, every day sometimes make me scratch my head. Uh, we could have uh, lengthy decisions about some of the more recent criminal law decisions that, to me, are are, are confusing. Uh, uh you know, uh, the one that always pops in my head is the PALS decision, uh, which dealt mm. with whether or not you had the ability uh, when you asked a person, can I search your car? And they tell you yes. And now all of a sudden the answer is no. Uh, we could get into a lengthy decision about the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure and, and everything else if that's what we want to do. My, my just view from as a, a prosecutor, I want to be able to tell my cops this is what the law is. If you do this, you're going to be safe. It's going to be a good search. And my problem that I have sometimes now uh, is I'm not certain what to advise my law enforcement officers on based on what the current state of the law is. And that's scary to me. And I think it should be even scary to a defense attorney because you don't, you just don't know. It it makes it really tough. And we're trying to advise a client who may or may not have gotten himself or herself into some trouble and to, to say to them, well, the, the, the bag was maybe yours, but if you gave it just, it though though that uh, the Fourth Amendment not and in particular, if we're going to talk about that for for a second, has been so chopped up, sliced, diced, and and uh, and spit back out over years and years and years of not just Iowa State Supreme Court decisions, but the United States Supreme Court, um, that it's tough to get a handle on it, and it seems like every con- every decision that's been handed down serves to muddy the water rather than clarify it. Yeah. Now I have another question for you. Uh, legalization of marijuana is a, is an issue that's sweeping across the the uh, nation. And um, do you support one legalizing, and if not legalizing, medicalizing marijuana, or, or would you keep the laws the same and try to enforce the laws more rigorously? I'm opposed to the legalization of marijuana. I have grave concerns about the dangers it has placed law enforcement in in areas such as Colorado. Uh, I've been to a number of trainings as it relates to drug endangered children and the like. There is no question the parent who is intoxicated, whether or not through alcohol or marijuana, isn't an appropriate person to be parenting at a specific time. I also have listened in horror to some of the stories about law enforcement officers who have had career-ending complications from dealing with these grow operations, whereas it may be that each one of us could own six plants, but we decide to rent an apartment and you keep your six plants. I keep my six plants. Uh, and so now all of a sudden we have five friends all renting one apartment. Now we have 30 plants to grow this marijuana. One of the things that is a traditional uh, issue is that marijuana grows best when there's a lot of carbon dioxide, I believe. I may be incorrect on that. So basically what you start to see is air conditioning units flip the other way, a window air conditioning unit, so that whereas we would want the cold air to flow in, they want all the byproduct and chemicals to flow into the room. Now, all of a sudden, you got officers going in to those situations, situations where people have had, I think, even like mold on the, on the spinal cord, all sorts of things. The issue of medical marijuana, I'm not ducking. Again, I, I'm going to sound like a politician here. I don't know the medicine behind it well enough to offer an opinion. Uh, I know that when you're talking about some of the genetic splitting of THC, uh, I'm certainly not an expert on this. There, someone a lot smarter than I am is going to have to sit down and explain to me the ways that we can, if there are benefits, and there's certainly a lot of people out there who believe there are benefits uh, to cannabis, that uh, that perhaps there is a place for it. At this point, my view is it's illegal in the state of Iowa. It's illegal uh, according to the federal government. 
uh, through our, our drug laws, and those laws should be enforced. All right. Um, well, one of the ways I know, Ed, is through the Iowa Athletic Commission. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the Iowa Athletic Commission? I think it was, uh, it was during Governor Vilsack's term. I had a good friend of mine uh, who, uh, like Blake, he has friends who are conservatives. I have friends who are liberals. Uh, Gary Dickey was a, a Governor Vilsack's, I, I think, a general counsel and chief of staff, mm -hmm. or maybe not chief of, chief of staff, but policy director. Uh, he said, hey, why don't you come along to a, an MMA show? Uh, I had seen it on TV. This was at the time when it was more unregulated and significantly unsafe and uh, said, hey, would you like to come on board? The governor would like to expand the athletic commission through the Department of uh, Labor, uh, through the labor commissioner, have some more attorneys, look at ways to make the sport safer. And so that's how I initially got involved and, and have been involved ever since as an independent contractor in that regards. All right. Now, what, what are your responsibilities at the Iowa Athletic Commission? I am a deputy commissioner. I regulate individual fights. What that means is uh, I review the fights in advance. I ensure that they're uh, equal matchup. Uh, for folks who are fans of MMA, what you can sometimes know is that's a very difficult thing uh, to deal with. It's not like boxing where you can say, okay, has anyone fought a common opponent? You really are bringing a different skill set. You may have a guy who has real heavy hands fighting a guy who's great on the ground, and and that's a difficult thing to to match up, make sure that the matchups are fair, evenly matched. Secondly, ensure one of the big pushes that the commission has had, as you well know as, as a physician, is making sure they're as safe as humanly possible. So ensuring that there's appropriate security, ensuring that the promoters have health insurance, life insurance, uh, dealing with ensuring that the fighters have uh, medical or blood testing, then also uh, regulating the event while it occurs, keeping track of the results, doing the fighters meeting, reviewing Iowa law, because there are some differences between what you may see on TV through the UFC and what's legal in Iowa, making sure that that's known, and then making determinations as it relates to suspension, whether or not it's because of medical need, somebody breaks an orbital bone, uh, or whether or not it's several it, times, right? Or whether or not it's a disciplinary issue if someone's violated the rules or or brought, brought disgrace to the sport. All right, uh, we're going to be back right after this break. We're lucky to have Ed Bull with us, um, uh, IAC co-chairman extraordinaire, uh, Marion County attorney. Uh, we'll be back right after the break. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on Webcast Live. Webcast, you know what you're listening to. We'll see you back after the break. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening. We've got uh, my good friend and the Marion County Attorney, Ed Bull, with us for the entire hour. We're in the uh, the home stretch, and i got to tell you, I wasn't surprised. I know Doc wasn't surprised, but we've had a flood of questions coming in because finally we got, an, um, after probably years, I don't remember when, uh, when your brother was a guest on the show in this first iteration, you get two lawyers talking, and people have a whole crap load of questions for us. So I think that's yeah, Because you guys are good at confusing the issue. <laughs> you know, when you get paid by the hour, that's what you like to do, confuse the issue. I can't complain about that now, reasoning. We, we have a... Now, a couple of things I want to go over real quick. We have a comment about uh, in Colorado, everyone benefits because they all have anxiety. Do you feel anxious at times? Yes. Now you have your, your marijuana. Oh, sure. And, you know, the other thing is I can tell you I have a lot of friends and relatives that live in, in you know, the 
in these zones where you can get pot. I can tell you I've heard some real horror stories. I've watched some people in my family start to struggle after the introduction of this because, you know, oh, well, now it's legal. I can I can smoke it and everything else. Watch some friends go through this. Um, you know, and I understand that's medicalization. And from my perspective, I, you know, I believe that uh, medical marijuana can help a lot of different patients. But at this point, basically what it's doing is just everybody gets it, you know. Um, and well, go I back to to Clo, the the Clo Baldler, uh, yeah, who Clo Clo, you know, went out to California, walked in, said I I don't remember what he said. I, I think according to his newsletter, I think he may have said he had hemorrhoids, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. And he walks out the door with a prescription for medical marijuana. Uh, you know, the reality is there may be legitimate purposes for it. I, I would just remind people one of the things that I think it would be interesting is. In the state of Iowa, for example, if you have any detectable level of marijuana in your system and you get caught driving a vehicle, that's an operation while intoxicated. Uh, Now, it is not they've made a change as it relates to the vehicular homicide issues that you have to draw a correlation. Uh, But any and so my question would be when you legalize certain drugs, but they have effects when people are under the influence of them whether or not they've also examined how they need to change some of their other criminal laws that mm-hmm. deal with with the uh, the uh, after effects of consuming the drug. Well, I mean, mar- marijuana, to me, if I'm, if I'm going to weigh in here, if we're going to talk about this for the last little bit, because first of all, if, if there are any clients of mine who are listening to this podcast, I certainly do not want them to get the impression that I'm advising them to go out and smoke as much marijuana as possible. It's still illegal. Don't do it. If you get caught, I can't help you. But... Um, I mean, my personal my personal position on this is that at, at this point, the effects of marijuana, with respect to driving, I'll take your first the, your most recent point. The effects of marijuana while driving are similar, and actually not nearly as serious as the effects of alcohol while driving. And they're also almost from from just an observational perspective as easily discernible. Police uh, police officers are trained to um, are in, trained to observe the. The uh, the signs and, and signals of intoxication by alcohol, the the red eyes, the, the the smell, the slurred speech, in the same way that they are trained to uh, see the the signs of, of intoxication with marijuana, whether it be the red eyes, the the kind of glassy appearance, and and maybe the smell of burnt marijuana inside the car. And so I feel like if if marijuana were ever legalized, that transition wouldn't be that difficult. Also, I mean the idea that that marijuana can't be con- responsibly consumed sort of lends itself to the idea that alcohol itself can't be responsibly consumed. I don't think anybody in this room would make right. that point. Just got a, just got a question. Um, it, uh, one of the, the question here, I'm going to rephrase it because he, he, this person disagrees with lefty quite a bit. It's not my brother, by the way. Oh, sure. Although he did text and say it doesn't matter what, what you said he disagreed because he just now tuned in. No, that's okay. And I do want to issue my uh, some of these for my brother Joe. Uh, he lost his, his uh, very beloved pet yesterday and it was very traumatic. Sorry so, to hear that. Yeah. Anyway, this person says, uh, um, if you're driving down the road and you happen to be pulled over and you smoked two weeks ago, but you're not currently under the influence of 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 marijuana, can you still be charged for driving under the influence because the metabolites still show up? The law in the state of Iowa, unless it's changed, and someone could correct me if I'm wrong, because as I, I indicated, I don't handle our OWI docket, and, and but my understanding of the current state of Iowa law is any detectable level. Now, detectable level is based on a nanograms. It, it, there's a cutoff level. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, But if in that example that you just gave, I can say as a defense attorney, my first OWI case I ever did when it was when I was a Drake Law student at the clinic, and the case was an OWI because of marijuana, and the person had a detectable level, and his defense was, "Well, I smoked weeks ago." It's a per se violation of Iowa law. It's like blowing point, oh, uh, you know, one two. Sure, I I don't, and I haven't, I haven't pulled a uh, an o, an OWI with with marijuana yet, so I haven't had it. I haven't recently looked at that aspect of the code, but I feel like. The the last couple of these cases that I've sort of heard about anecdotally, they they haven't gone so far. I mean, there are other op- there are other thing other factors in play there. If you know, if the the police officer doesn't detect you or isn't going to test you because there's no reasonable suspicion or probable cause, you're under the influence of marijuana. Obviously, that's not going to be as 
um, there's a there's sort of a stepping stone yeah. effect to that. Well, but the other thing is, and I tell all my remember. patients that I prescribe medications to, doesn't matter what medication, even if it's prescribed by a doctor, and this is what I do know about the law, mm-hmm. um, if you get pulled over, even if it's a prescription medication, you can still be charged with operating while under the influence. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you got if you're smoking weed, drinking, or you're using Xanax or well, Risperdal or whatever it is. Well, I, I and correct you read these cases a lot more often than I do, but I thought there was a case like this recently in the Supreme Court level that kind of said, or that said that held if you're taking prescription drugs at the direction of your physician in accordance with that prescription, and your doctor has not said anything about you not being able to drive, that's not operating while intoxicated. There, there is an affirmative defense to pres- consume prescription medication in compliance with a doctor's right. uh, issue. The, re- the reality is I'm not certain when the last time you got a prescription filled at any of your local uh, pharmacies where if it didn't, uh, they almost always have the warning on the that, label yeah, that says right. don't, don't do X, Y, or Z. I mean, the reality going back to your issue, you know, we have certain certifications for law enforcement officers that are drug recognition experts. Mm -hmm. They are the people that we call in. There's no question that when local law enforcement does a horizontal nystagmus test, your pupils are going to bounce a different way if you're high than if you're drunk. And that's a telltale sign. You get brought back to the station. You may very well blow zeros on the data master, uh, but we're then going to take your urine or your blood. And then we're going to wait 30 days for it to come back from the lab and, I, I can tell you we, we file those charges all the time. Right, but is, is that going to be two weeks later or a month later? I don't think so. That's I mean, that's, that's if it's the, a de- the if, it's, if it's a detectable level, you're right. The bottom line is, as we well know, methamphetamines is going to be out of your system at 72 to 96 that's hours. Right. Marijuana, if you're a heavy guy like me, uh, it might be 30 days. And, and speaking of which, we have to talk after the show. About? about? About that deal that we talked about before the show with respect to us hanging out later and eating a whole bunch of pizza. Ah, okay. I'm, a, I'm so making you'll a be ba- under the influence of pasta? Yeah, sure. Is Carbohydrate overload. Carbo- yeah, Fair yeah, enough. Right. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions. Um, I did uh, look up this Obama uh, apology to the Afghans. been keeping an eye on that. Uh, Reuters reported it. HuffPo kind of sort of reported it. It's, of course, it's front page on Fox. CNBC reported it, but now I can't find it. And according to the internet here, 26 minutes ago uh, during the show, the White House released a press statement that said there will be no apology from the United States to the Afghan people. You see, the Doc and Lefty program changing hearts and minds in the Obama administration. This well, is why you have me on the show. Let, let's hope, because, geez, somebody got to talk some sense into that clown. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Um, anyway, well, we're going to close out the show here. We want to thank Ed for showing up. Remember, he's running for Marion County Attorney. There's nobody running against you, is there? There isn't as of right now, but, you know, you don't take out your paperwork until early to mid next year. So all right, uh, I'd, I'd like to think no one would run against me. It would make my wife uh, and family and, and uh, my spring and summer significantly easier. Uh, but uh, we'll take all challengers. What's the uh, – uh, on a on – a- Party note, what's your outlook? What's your sort of like your your prog- your prognosis for Marion County in the next uh, four years should you be reelected? I think that we will continue. I, I said from the very beginning I wanted to have uh, a county attorney's office that was respected uh, by my peers, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, feared by criminals, and appreciated by law enforcement. And that's what we'll continue to do. I, I want to make it clear, if you want to break the law, don't do it in my county. There you have it, folks. I want to thank Ed Bull for being here. I want to thank uh, Doc for uh, being my my all, my other true friend. And the voice of reason on <laughs> and, the show. And, and, sure. And the That's voice, right. voice of reason. You know what? What A lot of times the comments I get on here is, how can you even stand talking to lefty? You know, and these are not even people that, you know, are family related to me. I mean, these are people out there every once in a while I'll get it on Facebook too how do you even talk to the guy my girlfriend says the same thing it's you a dis- can't, can't really stand it's a disgusting to problem <laughs> I should I should really go see a qualified right. psychiatrist to help me so out so if they want to get a hold of you and support your campaign what do they what do people have to do uh, well as I said we're in the early stages but keep an eye on Facebook there'll be a re-election page okay uh, and uh, just Ed Bull yeah just you can you can uh Google Ed Bull. You can go to Facebook, look at uh, right now our, our page is the Marion County Attorney's Office page. Please uh, friend that. Uh, we post uh, press releases 
uh, concerning successes and concerns we may have, some public relation issues. That's the best place to get all the information about the Marion County Attorney's Office right now. Uh, we have great relationships with our local media as well, uh, local radio station, local paper. They tend to do a real nice job uh, talking about uh, our successes and sometimes uh, fairly being critical when they when they feel they need to be. Uh, but uh, great opportunities to gather information on Facebook at the Marion County Attorney's Iowa uh, Facebook page. All right, great. Thanks, Ed, for tuning for coming in tonight, and thank to thank you to all of our listeners for listening tonight. Even though I stumbled a couple of times, that's okay. So, you doing any gigs this week? Uh, nothing, nothing coming up. No. All right, everybody, have a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not going to be here next week. Lefty's got a great guest coming on. Uh, so apparently Lefty has decided he's going to start pulling his own weight, so that's <laughs> that's pretty good. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back. Lefty will be back next week uh, right here on the station, webcast1live.com, at the same time, 6.30 on Tuesdays. Cheers, everybody. Hi, I'm Representative Tom Shaw, and I love these guys, both of them. Love these guys. <laughs> Get over here. Get over here. Love both of them.